people are influenced a lot by what they see on TV. And this is according to, to studies, not just uh, guessing. And um, the way they see teenagers act on television is kind of, people aren't around teenagers a lot, they'll assume that's the way they act in real life. I would say for crimes, without a doubt, that there's still definitely, there has been for a long time, and there probably will be for a while, the, the general bias against teenagers, people are, people are afraid of teenagers. The boys have, throughout time, teenagers that age have committed crimes like that. Unless maybe that's the unfairness of the media. Now you just keep in mind that you work for me. And I have 35 people coming to this is unacceptable. I mean, I have to have the eater working. I have to have everything there. No, this is not right. Uh, when you see teenagers from a distance or just immediate images, you don't know what, what they act like in real life. The world is made up of many different countries, cultures, and peoples. Yet despite all these differences, they all have one important thing in common. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is what it says in the very first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of December 10, 1948. The notion of human rights has become one of the most important in the history of humankind. But what exactly are human rights? Who is responsible for protecting them? And do they really apply to all people? We describe human rights as those rights which apply to every single person simply because he or she is a human being. They are innate. Human rights apply to every person in every part of the world without exception. They are therefore universal. They also apply equally to everyone, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, skin color, age, or other features that may distinguish one person from another. Human rights are part of international law. 
The UN Charter of 1946 already contained important passages on the meaning and protection of human rights. The first proper international agreement was the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. In 1966, the UN adopted two more international covenants, one on civil and political rights, and the other on economic, social, and cultural rights. These declarations are collectively known as the International Bill of Human Rights and are the most important legal basis for human rights. In addition, there is a series of UN conventions. For example, the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention Against Torture, or the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But what are the specific human rights anchored in these conventions? Human rights are often divided into three generations or dimensions. The first dimension, the classic political and civil liberty rights. These include the right to life and physical integrity, a ban on slavery and forced labor, protection from torture, freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, a comprehensive ban on discrimination, and the right to vote. The second dimension, the economic, social, and cultural human rights. These include the right to work and to a decent wage, the right to form trade unions, equality between men and women, the protection of families, pregnant women, mothers, and children, the right to a decent standard of living, including the right to adequate food, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to education, and the right to participate in cultural life. The third dimension deals with the rights of groups. It includes the right to self-determination, the right to development, the right to a clean environment, and the right to peace. The principle of the indivisibility of human rights is important. That means none of the rights listed in the political, economic, social, and cultural human rights may have precedence over the others. Human rights can only be consummated when all facets work together. The exercise of civil and political rights depends on the safeguarding of economic, social, and cultural rights and vice versa. And who exactly has the job of implementing and upholding human rights? Countries carry the main responsibility. They are obliged to refrain from any action that would violate human rights, must protect them from violation, and create the necessary conditions for people to fully exercise their human rights. The UN's central body is the Human Rights Council, a body of 47 countries based in Geneva. It reviews the situation on human rights on a regular basis in all of the UN member states. It can also send independent experts to individual countries. The problem, there are many countries on the Council which do not themselves uphold human rights. The UN Security Council concerns itself particularly with the protection of human rights during wars and armed conflicts. For example, it works to end the recruitment of child soldiers. The High Commissioner for Human Rights is responsible for coordinating the human rights work of the entire UN body. She has local offices in all parts of the world and can send human rights experts to UN peace missions. The International Criminal Court in The Hague. With its establishment in 1998, the world has an authority capable of investigating and passing sentence on particularly grave breaches of human rights, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Its powers are still limited now. It lacks the support of important countries, like the USA and China. But a crucial step has been taken. War criminals can no longer commit their transgressions with impunity. Along with the global institutes of the UN, there are various regional human rights agreements and bodies. The European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and the American Convention on Human Rights. Civil society has an especially important role to play. Non-governmental organizations, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, monitor the observance of human rights in places all over the world. They draw attention to abuses and exert pressure on governments through public campaigns. They also play an important role in the ongoing development of the legal basis for human rights. 
the creation of independent national institutes for human rights, which have an indispensable role as watchdogs, is also important. Are there any controversial aspects about human rights? Yes, there are two main points of contention. Issue number one, the universal nature of human rights. The argument? The notion of human rights originates in the West and cannot simply be transferred to other cultures. It is true, the development and spread of the notion of human rights carry the marks of cultural developments and traditions. But it is also true that no human being wants to be tortured or discriminated against because of her religion or skin color. Every human being wants to be able to speak his opinion without fear of persecution. Every human being wants a life of dignity with a roof over her head, without having to suffer hunger or thirst. All these ideas are included in the notion of the universality of human rights. It is important to note that it is frequently countries or groups which are themselves responsible for human rights violations that call this universality into question. Issue number two. Western countries are accused of using human rights as a pretext for military intervention in other countries and of committing human rights abuses themselves. It is clear, no country is the sole defender of human rights. Human rights are violated in Western countries too. Especially following the attacks of 9-11, measures were introduced that compromised human rights. The justification, the war on terrorism. We see that human rights are very particular rights. They apply equally to every individual. Respect for and protection of human rights must be at the heart of government activity, since human beings are both the reason for and the object of every policy. People do not exist for the state, but the state for people. The struggle to secure and defend human rights must be continually renewed, for we can only secure permanent peace and stability if we respect human rights. My name is Doreen Ellen Beldotan, and um, after a day's rest from a marathon of watching the videos on Ronit Emerald's channel on YouTube, um, and sleeping on it eventually, and uh, sleeping very fitfully, I have uh, no recourse but to conclude that people working in social services, the entire systems, have to be uh, have to be investigated on the local, national, and international levels, 
and there are people who need to be charged with crimes against humanity. Serial crimes against the weakest people in society, the most needy people, the most helpless people, the most gentle people. That which I have seen on Ronit Emerald's channel rivals that which I remember hearing when I saw films of the Nuremberg trials. I do not use the word atrocity easily. I don't like people who use that word for, to gain political capital. I'm certainly not one of the people that uses the word to lessen its meaning with overuse. But I'm using the word atrocities now because that's what these are. When babies are stolen out of a hospital and when they, they have uh, either behavioral problems or for whatever reason they are not as uh, suitable for fostering or adoption, they are put into institutions for people who are retarded when it's known that they are not retarded and they're kept there, one man was kept there for 30 years. Another woman who was kept in an institution for the mentally retarded who was not mentally retarded relates a story of receiving the following punishment. She was stripped down to her brawn panties, tied to a stretcher, left out in the open, and the staff told the other residents at the institution that they could do with her as they liked, including urinating on her. And then she was told that after that was all over that she would be buried. She went back to that institution with someone who was investigating what she said, and when she got there, a man at the institution who remembered her came to the door and she said to him, do you remember the day that I was outside? And he told the same story that she told. He did remember it. Yes, he did. That's his true story. We are dealing with atrocities and they have to be dealt with as atrocities. And I am asking people in Israel and all over the world who know of stories, who have experienced stories, and not experienced stories, experienced horrors at the hands of the social workers to turn to the various human rights groups with a request that they be charged with serial crimes against the most helpless people in society in humanity. Recently I have been learning a little bit about uh, the underlying levels of law that exist and I'm mentioning this because I know how profoundly corrupted the judicial systems are in all countries. It may behoove some of us to see if we can investigate and charge them according to common law or to Roman civil law or to natural law. It may be, um, we may find more justice according to those systems in our various countries. And I'm turning to those who know a lot more about this to look into it. Natural law has been hijacked as a cause by um, the followers of uh, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, those people who do a transcendental meditation. We know that when something is of tremendous value, what the systems tend to do is have it co-opted and preempted by a specific group that has some kind of um, a take on the world that the average citizen, the average person would not feel comfortable with. That being the case, 
please do not reject uh, natural law out of hand, even if you're not in in uh, uh, if you're not a transcendental meditator. I'm not a transcendental meditator, uh, but I still think that uh, natural law is is something very important to look into. This is a plea. This is um, I'm, <laughs> I'm begging. This cries out for justice. These people have committed serial atrocities against those who deserve the most help and their families, and they must be brought to justice. Thank you for listening. The UN Decade for Women was declared in 1975. At the first UN World Conference on Women in Mexico City, equal rights, development and peace were on the agenda. For the first time, action plans were drawn up to eliminate discrimination against women. Later, at World Conferences on Women in Copenhagen and Nairobi, these action plans were reviewed, revised and amended. The biggest World Conference on Women was held 20 years ago. From 189 countries, 47,000 people took part. That was in 1995 in Beijing. The conference ended with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, calling for comprehensive equal rights for women, women's equal participation in economic, social, cultural and political decision-making. It also identified 12 main issues causing discrimination against women. Gender mainstreaming became part of international women's policy-making. Beijing was hailed as a victory for the women's movement. 189 states ratified the declaration but the goals are far from being achieved. For example, health. The concept of women's reproductive health means women make their own decisions about their sexuality and reproductive rights. Yet the right to abortion is not established as a human right. Human rights. Women's human rights should be strengthened and women's rights should be recognized as human rights. Yet the declaration wasn't signed by Iran, Sudan or Somalia and wasn't ratified by the United States. Violence and armed conflicts. Sexual violence in conflict is defined as a crime against humanity and should be prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. The more militaristic the society, the greater the violence and dominance of masculine values and the higher the rate of domestic violence. Sexual violence is also a part of war strategy. Economics and positions of power. There are now 19 female heads of state, more than ever before in world history. Many countries have quotas for regional and national parliaments. Yet the quotas are set at only 20 to 30 percent in most countries. Perceptions of traditional family and gender roles continue to hamper women's political involvement. As of today, the vast majority of states have failed to comply with the obligations set out in Beijing. Twenty years after Beijing, there's still much to do. Women's rights are human rights. It's time to make women's rights a reality. Now.
Believe it or not, we live and breathe sociology every day. We interact in groups on a daily basis, and we depend on each other for socialization. Because of this, we might take sociology for granted. We might not even know that we create and recreate our social world daily. Isn't sociology just common sense? Well, not really. Common sense depends on our own observations and life experiences, but those observations and experiences are often very different from someone, say, who lives in a different part of the country or world. Not everyone's experiences are the same. People don't behave the way they are just because that's who they are. We are heavily influenced by society. Sociology applies the scientific method and aims to understand how groups of people may experience life and be affected by values, beliefs, behaviors, and even events and the way society is structured. Applying a scientific analysis helps us begin to understand a large, socially complex picture. So what is the scientific method? Let's break it down into six steps that will give us a greater understanding of how the discipline of sociology is different than common sense. The first step in the scientific method is to ask a question. Really, you can either ask a question, define a problem, or define an area of interest. Being very specific and narrow is important in this step. Asking a question such as, what makes a culture rich, is too vague because the word rich can be defined in a number of different ways. Do we mean rich as in monetary wealth, or do we mean rich as in living fulfilling lives? Or maybe we mean the material products a culture produces and their value to society. The more specific you are, the better chance there is to have a valid study, or a study that measures what it is meant to measure. Next, you need to research existing sources. This step is otherwise known as a literature review. Researching existing studies helps a researcher understand their own topic better and to build a study that would add to the research already conducted. One thing you want to make sure that you absolutely do not do is to create a study that has already been done or to plagiarize previous work. After this step, you formulate a hypothesis. You may have already heard a hypothesis defined as an educated guess. While this is true, there's a bit more to a hypothesis. A hypothesis makes a correlation between two variables. One variable tends to predict how another variable will change. These two variables are referred to as the independent and dependent variables. The independent variable is the cause of the change. The dependent variable is the effect or the thing that is changed. In other words, the dependent variable depends on the independent variable for its results. If we are studying gender, and want to know about how people in the workplace are treated based on identifying as male or female, identifying as male or female is the independent variable and how they are treated is the dependent variable. The fourth step is to design and conduct a study. There are many different types of studies you can conduct, including surveys, field research, engaging in participant observation, or in ethnography. You can conduct an analysis of a single event or a person through a case study, design an experiment, or review existing research. Each of these methods are a distinct approach, serve a specific purpose, and are discussed in depth in our text. The type of information you yield from each study is very different. For example, surveys are great for gathering demographic information on a particular culture, such as how many in that population identify as male or female but would not be good for understanding the ways that people are treated differently in the workplace based on identifying as male or female. After you design and conduct a study, you draw conclusions. The type of hypothesis you create and the type of study you conduct will determine the study's conclusions. It is important to note that in this step and throughout the study, remaining objective is an important role of any researcher. A researcher must let the study speak for itself and not manipulate the findings to say what he or she thought the conclusions would be or what they want them to be. Last, you report results. Reporting results adds to the body of research and creates an informed society. If the study was funded by outside sources, those sources need to be included in the information. Once again, ethics and objectivity are important as conclusions should not be biased by the group or organization that funded the study. By reporting results, researchers are held responsible for the methodology and findings. So, now that you know about the scientific research process, 
What is one current social topic or issue that can be better understood by applying the scientific method? Discuss one topic and two different research designs that could be applied to that topic. How would the findings be different based on the design? In other than objectivity, what are other ethical issues that researchers face? These two Nazi scientists worked at the Dachau concentration camp during World War II. They were conducting an experiment to see how long a human being could survive in freezing water. Like good scientists, they took systematic measures, including duration until death. Examples of human cruelty of this kind raise a big question. How is it possible to treat a person as a mere object? The traditional explanation for human cruelty is in terms of evil. I find the concept of evil unhelpful and unscientific. It implies that the person is possessed by some supernatural force. Even worse, it's dangerously circular. If the definition of evil is the absence of good, then all we're really saying is he did something bad because he's not good. It hasn't really taken us any further forward. In contrast, the concept of empathy, I'm going to argue, is scientifically helpful. You can measure it, you can study it. Empathy has two distinct components, cognitive and affective. Cognitive empathy is the ability to imagine someone else's thoughts and feelings, putting yourself into someone else's shoes. It's the recognition part. Affective empathy is the drive to respond with an appropriate emotion to what someone else is thinking or feeling. And I'm going to argue that low affective empathy is a necessary factor to explain human cruelty. Empathy isn't all or none. It comes by degrees, and there are individual differences in it. So it gives rise to the empathy bell curve. Most of us are in the middle of this spectrum with average amounts of empathy. There are some people who have above average levels of empathy. But what are the factors that can lead an individual to have low empathy, either temporarily or permanently, what are those social factors, what are those biological factors? One social factor is obedience to authority. The experiment by Stanley Milgram at Yale University showed that people are willing to administer electric shocks to someone to help them learn if they're instructed to do so by an authority figure. This suggests that simply following orders may be one factor that can erode our empathy. A second social factor is ideology. When the terrorists flew the planes into the World Trade Center on 9-11, we have to assume that they were in the grip of a strongly held belief that they were doing the right thing. Of course, we don't know whether the terrorists who signed up for that action had low empathy to begin with, but it's possible that their ideological beliefs were another factor that could erode their empathy for their victims. And a third social factor is in-group, out-group relations. In Rwanda, we saw that one ethnic group used propaganda to stereotype the out-group, describing them as subhuman and as cockroaches. When we dehumanize a group as the enemy, we have the potential to lose our empathy, and we saw the catastrophic genocide that ensued. But none of these social factors can explain individuals like Ted Bundy. 
He started his adult career as a psychology student at the University of Washington, where he volunteered on a telephone helpline and persuaded women to meet him. And over the successive years, he com committed rape and murder of at least 30 women. We can assume that he had good cognitive empathy because he was able to deceive his victims, but that he lacked affective empathy, he just didn't care, and he lacked it in enduring ways. The evidence that psychopaths like Ted Bundy lack affective empathy comes from an experiment by James Blair that was conducted in Broadmoor Hospital. He showed psychopaths and the control group three different types of images. Threatening images, neutral images, and images of people in distress. And what he found was that the psychopaths only showed reduced physiological response when they saw the images of people in distress. So this suggests that they lacked affective empathy. People with autism have difficulties with cognitive empathy. They struggle to imagine other people's thoughts, their motives, their intentions, and their feelings. But people with autism don't tend to hurt other people. Instead, they're confused by other people and withdraw socially, preferring the more predictable world of objects. People with autism have intact affective empathy because when they hear that somebody is suffering, it upsets them. This leads us to imagine that people with autism and psychopaths are mirror opposites. The psychopath has good cognitive empathy, that's how they can deceive, but they have reduced affective empathy. People with autism have intact affective empathy, but struggle with cognitive empathy for neurological reasons. Psychopaths don't come out of nowhere. Many of them have shown antisocial behavior and delinquency in their teens. John Bowlby at the Tavistock Clinic in London studied delinquents and found that many of them had experienced emotional neglect in early childhood. He argued that the absence of parental love in early childhood is another factor that can erode your empathy. But we know that early experience can't be the whole story because not everyone who has a bad childhood loses their empathy. Absalom Caspi at the Institute of Psychiatry in London showed that if you've experienced severe maltreatment in childhood, that increases your risk of delinquency. But your risk of delinquency goes up even more if you're also a carrier of one version of the MAOA gene, shown here in red. So genes and environment interact. And another biological factor that is associated with empathy levels is the hormone testosterone. In the fetus, testosterone shapes brain development. We've measured testosterone in the amniotic fluid that surrounds the baby in women who are having amniocentesis during pregnancy. We then wait for the baby to be born and we follow up the children. When the children were eight years old, we asked them which word best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. Here the correct answer is that he's interested in something. And what we found was that the higher the level of fetal testosterone, the more difficulties the child was having on this cognitive, at this test of cognitive empathy. How much empathy we show is a function of the empathy circuit, a network of regions in the brain. Here we can look at just two of them. Uh, in red, the left ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and in blue, the amygdala. This is Phineas Gage, who suffered damage to his left ventromedial prefrontal cortex after dynamite blasted a metal rod up behind his eye and through his brain. Before the accident, he was described as a polite, considerate individual. After the accident, he was described as rude and no longer able to judge what was socially appropriate for different situations. 
He'd lost his cognitive empathy. And Jean de Setti at the University of Chicago used brain scanning, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to look at the teenage delinquent brain whilst they were watching films where somebody experiences pain, such as when this piano player's fingers got crushed by the lid of the piano falling down on his fingers. What he found was that teenagers with delinquency didn't show the typical levels of activity in the amygdala, part of the empathy circuit in the brain. But let's not forget the positive side of empathy. Most of us have enough empathy, and some people have high levels of empathy. When these two men formed a relationship based on mutual respect and on empathy, it led to the end of apartheid in South Africa. Empathy is vital for a healthy democracy. It ensures that we listen to different perspectives and that we hear other people's emotions and we, we also feel them. Indeed, without empathy, democracy would not be possible. I met these two women in Cambridge this week when they came to visit. On the left is Siham, and she's a Palestinian woman, and her brother was shot and killed by an Israeli bullet. On the right is Robbie. She's an Israeli woman, and her son was killed by a Palestinian bullet. These two women have taken the courageous step of forming a relationship across the political divide. They haven't given in to the emotion of revenge, which would simply perpetuate the cycle of violence. Instead, they've used their empathy to recognize that they both share the same sorrow, the same awful pain of having lost a loved one. Empathy is our most valuable natural resource for conflict resolution. We could wait for our political leaders to use empathy, and that would be refreshing, but actually we can all use our empathy. As Siham and Robbie told me, the conflict won't stop until we empathize. Thank you.